Good evening, everyone. Yesterday was Parashat Lech Lecha in the Torah, as we started the new cycle of the year in Rosh Hashanah, and Simchat Torah, I should say. And uh, there are a few in, very important things we learn from the parasha. It also relates to tefillah, to the davening, to the prayers that we have every day. As we know, the parasha started that Kadosh Baruch Hu told Avraham to leave everything in his place and to go to a different country. No explanation was given. God never told him where he's going. It's not so simple to move, as we know in our generation, when you have all the, 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 the cars and we have everything is electronic, it's still very hard to, to move. In the old days, we have so, much, so many animals, cows, donkeys, slaves, to start taking everyone with you where you go, it's not so simple. If it was only you and your wife and few children, you can control it. But you have hundreds of slaves and servants, they have their own kids, to transfer them to a new climate, new place, it's not so simple. And still, Abraham Avinu doesn't make a beep. He doesn't ask Hashem where, how can it be, Hashem, I'm doing so, so well here. Because, you know, Abraham Avinu, when he was 52 years old, he started to teach people about God. When he was three years old, he started to search for God, all these years. His father was worshipping idols, Terach, even though he made Shuvah in the end of his life, but still, Abraham grew up in a very bad environment. All the people in the world was worshipping idols. One little kid starting to search Hashem. He has ten tests in his life, on and off, and until Hashem sees that he's worthy to give him some kind of mission. But Abraham, age 52, it was 1948, according to the Jewish calendar, when Abraham was born, and age 52, he started to teach Torah and make seminars and teach about God, about the purpose of life. So that's exactly the year 2000 in a Jewish calendar. As the Gemara says, this wall is divided to three-thirds. 2,000 years, complete mess, tov avo, and then 2,000 years of Torah, and then 2,000 years, times of Mashiach. Time that Mashiach can arrive any moment. It's the last third of the creation. The world is 6,000 years altogether. We are now in a time of Mashiach. We can see everything is ready according to the prophecies. It can happen any second. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him that he has to go to leave his father's house, to leave his place, everything. And the Torah says something very interesting. The Torah says that they took with them not only all their belongings, they took et nefesh asher asu becharan, the souls that they created in the place that called Haran. Well, how can you create souls? Only God can create souls. It's a spiritual thing. So this expression means that according to God, to the Torah, when a Jew saved the soul of another Jew, or a person saved the soul of another person, it counts like he created him. It becomes automatically it's his spiritual son forever, for eternity. What does it mean for eternity? If he was, I don't know, 20 years old, and he made him Shomer Shabbos, he gave him some CDs, books, he spoke to him on the phone, invited him to lectures, and slowly, slowly that person became religious, even partially. Even if he does 50% of the mitzvot, 30%, 80%, whatever he does, Every time he does a mitzvah, it's like a father that has a son, that his son made a mitzvah, so the father benefits from it. It's a spiritual kid. And then if he has kids, then it's his grandkids. And then if those kids have kids, then it's his grand-grandkids. It can be thousands of years, forever and ever. One day Hashem will finish this world, this creation will be finished completely. There's not going to be earth anymore. And a person continue to benefit from all the things that the people did, even though they're not doing mitzvot anymore, because there's no place to do mitzvot. It can be hundreds of years later. But the mitzvot that they created in their lifetime stands for this person forever and ever. So Hashem says that Avram was teaching people, Avram and Sarah, not only Avram, teaching them about God and all these people who joined them, which means there was no Torah yet, but they realized that there is one God, and they left all their idols, which is a very big sin even for the Goim to worship idols. Just the fact that Abraham told them that there is God, you should only follow one God, you should appreciate him, you should thank him, when you eat you have to bless him, all these things, this main thing, was stands for Abraham forever. 
Then the Gemara brings an example of Rish Lakish. Rish Lakish, if you remember one of my previous lectures, he used to be a gangster. That's how he grew up. He had a gang. They were robbing people, whatever they did, who knows. And one day he became religious. I don't want to start describing the whole story. He met Rabbi Yochanan. He, he thought Rabbi Yochanan is a woman from far away because Rabbi Yochanan didn't have a beard. And he was a very, very pretty person, one of the most handsome people. So he thought it's a woman in a lake, this gangster, this criminal. So he jumped, he swimmed all the way. He found, he turns around, he saw, eh, disappointment. <laughs> it's Rabbi Yochanan. It's a rabbi, you know? So you may ask, how did he think he's, he's a woman? Maybe his hair was short? No, in a lake, they have peot from the farm far away. It looks like the beautiful hair of a woman. And that's what happened. So he told him, if you become tzaddik, I'll give you my sister. She's much prettier than me. And that's how he started. The Chazal says, If you start not for the right purpose, Later on, it becomes for the right purpose. Why? You already have a system. So after he made him his chevruta, they learned together. They were perfect match, chevruta. When Rish Lakish saw that Rabbi Chia passed away, Rabbi Chia was one of the important rabbis in the time of the Gemara. He fast, fasted 300 days 300 times, not, not in a row, we don't know if it's in a row or not, but he fasted 300 days. 300 days, that's besides Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av and all the rest. He did not eat for 300 days for one reason. What? He wanted to see Rabbi Chia in his dream. 300 times. They used to have a, a special way. If they wanted to speak to somebody tzaddik that passed away, they used to make a special fasting, and they ask questions, and he comes to them in a dream and talks to them. It's called She'elat Chalom. After 300 times, Rabbi Chia never came to him. So he asked, why? I don't have the merit to speak to Rabbi Chia. And guess what was the, an the answer? The answer was, because Rabbi Chia taught a lot of Torah. Rish Lakish learned Torah. Since he became Baal Tshuva, he learned a lot of Torah in his town. Rabbi Chia was also learning Torah, but also teaching Torah, but going around teaching Torah. Because he was traveling and teaching people, and he gave a lot of his time to the public, Rish Lakish, which is a Baal Tshuva, you know what the Gemara says, in a place where Tshuva omdim, tzadikim gmurim cannot be. In a place where Tshuva reach, even from, from birth cannot get there. And even though he was a Baal Tshuva, just because Rabbi Chia, that wasn't a Baal Tshuva, he born religious, just because he was teaching Torah and going to people and bringing them to learn Torah, he couldn't see him. He couldn't get to his level. So, this is one example. Then the parasha continued. The parasha begins to speak about Lot. Lot is Abraham's nephew. The Torah said that the only reason that Lot followed Abraham because he was afraid that Abraham will die and all his billions will go to their slaves. Abraham doesn't have kids. He is his only relative. You know, Abraham is his uncle. And he has to watch the inheritance. Remember, there was no lawyers that call you, excuse me, you have a billion dollars waiting for you. Come here and collect. Abraham died, finished. He never know where he is. By the time you will find out what happened, everybody will take what they can. You know, the camels, the horses, the gold, whatever he has. So he has to guard to follow everything. So Lot follows him. Up to a certain point, Lot was okay. From a certain point, Lot, the Torah starts to talk about Lot, his nephew, as an, in a negative way. Especially when he went to Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. From this moment on, the Torah speaks about him as a complete rasha. Now you may ask, if he went to live in San Francisco, or in a village, or in King's Highway, what's his hood that Mashiach comes out of him? From all the people in history, Hashem takes such a person that was one time tzaddik, and then he moved to the village, or to Las Vegas. From him, he wants to bring Mashiach. So there are two mitzvot that Lord made in his life. Which one of the two you think brought him the schud that Mashiach will be his grandson? 
First mitzvah he made, when he was at home, the, the guests came to him, and the people of Sodom came to attack him. They wanted to rape the guest. They were male. Male wants to rape male. That's how it started. The Torah describes Sodom and Amora. That's what happened. The word AIDS and homosexuality appears in equal codes in that chapter in the Torah that speaks about it. No coincidence. So when Lot, he has his guest, and the people are attacking his home, breaking the windows, the door, Lot say, take my daughter. They don't want. Take me. Take me. Do whatever you want with me. Leave the guest. They are my guest. No, we don't want you. We know you. We, are, we want them. You're not supposed to have guests in this city. This is how bad they were. Not, it was illegal to have guests. Illegal to feed the poor. Interesting things they had. They made very hard laws over there. So, because he was willing to sacrifice himself, there was a very big mitzvah. So the angels, they didn't know it's angels. They took mirrors and they blinded the people. The people couldn't see. And that's how they told him, get out of here because we're going to destroy this place. Millions will die. God is sick and tired of them. He's going to destroy all of them. This is the first time an atomic bomb drop of people before Hiroshima. All the wicked people, in one second, Hashem killed all of them. That's how it was. Read the Torah. It happens already, before Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Oops, fire goes from the, fire, from the heaven, everybody dies. He got saved. That's one time he made mitzvah. Big mitzvah, no? He's willing to kill himself and his daughter for the guest that he doesn't know. They just showed up. Then he made another mitzvah. When he went with Avram to Egypt, Avram went to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah is a very beautiful woman. Now Avram knows that in a place that people have no fear from God, they're always going to do the worst sin that possible. If they have a little sin and a big sin, their Yetzer Ara will push them to the worst sin. So if they'll know Sarah is a married woman, you know, there are two possibilities. One, that they'll kill him and take her, because maybe they want to touch a married woman. And he told Sarah, tell, say that you are my sister. So far we know the story. Lot was standing there. He hears Avram is lying to them. He tells them she's my sister. And he, all he had to do was say, Avram, excuse me, uncle, you made a mistake. She's your wife. Innocent, play dumb. Avram, wife, not sister. What are you telling the king that she's your sister? Playing dumb. They'll kill Avram, and he wins everything. All the money goes to him. Everything. Because you know how the inheritance goes in the Torah. If you have kids, your kids inherit. The wife only gets her ketubah. If, let's say, somebody dies, according to the Torah, and he has property, his wife doesn't inherit it, unless if he wrote it on her name in his lifetime and he gave it to her. But if she dies, the, the sons take it. If there's no sons, the daughters take it, if there's daughters. If there's no boys and no girls, he died without kids, his wife doesn't take it, his brothers take it. If there's no brothers, the children of the brothers take it. This is how it goes. So Lord takes everything. He gives Sarah some money to eat, to maintain her. That's his obligation, and finished. That's how it goes. So all he has to do is say a word. They kill Avraham. He takes billions of dollars. He's the richest person in the world, Avraham Avinu, at that time. And he did not make a beep. And he was a very greedy person. The Torah said the only reason he went, he left his place to make sure that when Avraham died, he takes everything. So what happened? He did not say a word. Now, from which one of the two mitzvot you think he got the schut? Hashem gave him a prize. What's the prize? Mashiach's going to be your grandson. Which one of the two that was willing to kill himself for the guest? Or that because he was quiet and he did not say anything? First, first, first guest. Which one is a bigger sacrifice? That you're willing to die for the guest, or you sit and do nothing, and you don't say, because, you know, you have an opportunity to kill your uncle and take all his money. The answer is, because he was quiet and he did not say anything, Hashem said, Mashiach comes from him. Now the question is, okay, very nice. We have to understand why. First, the Torah already told us that he's a very greedy person. He loves money, and everything he did was for the money. So now he had an opportunity in one second to take all the money, and he passed his test. The first scenario, 
It's almost nothing. Almost no reward for him. Why? Because he grew up in the house of Avraham Avinu. When your father is machnis orchim, everyone, he runs, come, come, please, stay over, come for Shabbat. He runs to the market, he takes care of the poor, he brings them to the house. This is how you grow since you're a baby. It's already in your genes. You're not, you don't know any other way. Look, look at the Persians, look at the Bukharians, look at the Syrians. It's mentality, it's hundreds of years. Everybody becomes like his parents. This is what he knows, he doesn't know any other way. I don't want to say other places. You come to the house, they hardly give you a glass of water. Not because they're bad. If they want donation, they may give you a million dollars. It's not because they're stingy, they try to save $20 on a tea or coffee, whatever they sell. <laughs> it's their mentality. It's the mentality that they're not used to it. That's not in their mentality where they grew up. People are affected from the place, the environment where they grew up. It's so obvious, you can see it right away. So Hashem say, you grew up in Abraham Avinu's house, Abraham would also die for the guest. That's not, you're not a hero. It's in your genes. You, can, you cannot do any other way. But here, it's against your nature. You're a greedy person. You could make billions of dollars in one second. You get rid of Abraham, no. And you get everything. For that, he got what he got. When does the Torah made Lot officially... Rasha, wicked, when he decided to move to Las Vegas. Once he moved to Sdom, was business over there, automatically Hashem couldn't look at him anymore. Why? You got to live with all these wicked people. Oy la Rasha ve oy The Torah says, if a righteous Jew moves to a bad place to live with the wicked people, he continue to keep mitzvot. He still learns Torah. He still pray. He still do whatever he did before almost, everything. If, God forbid, a tragedy is said to come for that place, he dies with them. He doesn't get saved. Why? Because you went to live with them, you finish like them. That's what the Torah says. Chenitna reshut la mashchit la ashchit, eno mavdil ben tzadik le rasha. Once the Satan gets permission to arm, he destroys the whole place. He doesn't care there's few tzadikim there. Why, Why did you come to live there? Then, then we find something else. That when Lot was with Abraham, there was a very long period of time that Akalosh Baruch Hu did not want to speak to Abraham. Why? Because he's, he's together with a wicked person. Because Lot already set up his mind to go to Sdom. From this moment on, Hashem didn't come to Abraham as frequent as he was before. It's very interesting. Then the parasha continue, and you know, Abraham goes to save Lot. Lot was captured by the, by the kings, and now Abraham has to go and save him. Who comes to Abraham and tells him, go, your nephew is in jail, is captured? Og, the giant, one of the giants, Og. Why? He is in love with Sarah. He wants to take Sarah. So he is hoping that when Abraham goes to save his nephew, he'll get killed. Like this, he can take his wife. So, Abraham goes, Hashem makes him a miracle, he wins, he, re he, he rescues Lot, and then Abraham has a problem. What's his problem? He thinks that maybe Hashem paid him in his lifetime for his mitzvot. Why? How do we know? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to Abraham, this is exactly what he told him. He told him, Al tira, don't be afraid. Your reward is that waiting for you is huge. If Hashem comes to a person and says, don't be afraid, what do we know right away? That this person was afraid that he lost his reward. Otherwise, why Hashem talks to him? If he knows he thinks that I deserve a lot of reward and he's not afraid, why God is wasting time coming to him and say, don't be afraid. You're still going to get a huge reward. So Chazal explained, why Abraham thinks that he lost all his reward? Why? Because we have a rule. If you put yourself in a place of danger, and you have a miracle there, you get saved, you lose from your rewards of your mitzvot. Hashem takes it away. So if you have, I don't know, 90,000 kilo of reward, you just lost a few of them. Why? Because you walked in Harlem at 2 o'clock at night <laughs> with the press. It's already a place of a risk. Quiet in the neighborhoods over there. You know, people maybe will rob you. It's dangerous. Some neighborhoods, nobody wants to be there at 2 o'clock at night in a dark street. 
some places it's quiet, it's, pre, it's pretty safe. But if a person puts himself in a dangerous place, same thing in all kinds of places in Israel. When you know this is very dangerous areas, like in the Arab market, some of the tourists, let's see what the Arabs selling. Probably we'll find some bargains. Walking there, it's a life risk. You made it, nothing happened. Consider the fact that you may lose some of your rewards. Just the fact that you had a miracle doesn't mean that it's the nature. Hashem may be turning things around. You don't know. When you come to Shamaim, you see how many Arabs planned something and something went wrong in the last minute. All of a sudden, the Israeli soldiers went and they made the, the wrong turn and the Arabs saw them and they ran away. You don't know it. You don't know for how many things you get saved. This is how it works. Next thing. One other thing by the Avraham that he killed them. Even though they deserved to die, it was a war, everything was legit. A righteous person, when he has to kill somebody in a war, he suffers from that. One guy from Lakewood who drove his car and he hit two people, husbands and wife, older people in their 70s. He killed them. Accident. It wasn't his fault. The police check, and they saw that it wasn't his fault. They jump into the road, whatever the case was. He went to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, told him, Rabbi, it doesn't leave me alone, this. I killed these people, I hit them with a the car, you know. I have nightmares. Rav Chaim Kanievsky told him, listen, it was an accident, right? It wasn't your fault. Why you eat your heart? Maybe they are Zera Amalek. Maybe they are descendants of Amalek. You made a mitzvah from the Torah. Why you cry about something you don't know? You don't know? Okay. He goes back to Lakewood. After a few weeks, he sees an, uh, an ad. He's looking to buy an apartment, a house. A house. He sees an ad that somebody sells a house. He calls the broker. They take him to visit in a place, in a house. He goes to the place. What does he find out? That the son of these old people that he killed selling now the house. There's nobody there, so they're selling now the house. So the son of these old people put the house for sale. So as they walk around, they check the closets and everything. He opened one of the drawers over there. What does he see? Pictures of these people with SS uniforms, with Hitler. They belong to the Nazis organization. Exactly like Rav Chaim Kanievsky told him, maybe you killed Zera Amalek. What was the end of it? These two people were Nazis in Lakewood. That's probably many more. You never know. Everything only Hashem knows. As we continue, Abraham Avinu was an expert on reading the signs. What's the signs? He sees in a horoscope the future. Every person that is born, every minute, change in the time of his birth, change his entire future. If a person is supposed to be born today at 2.14, and the doctors made it a little bit faster, 2.11, let's say, it, it changes his entire future. Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, depend on the signs affecting the future of the people. But Jews are above the signs, above the fortune. Why? Because we are subject to free choice. If we do good, we earn. If we do bad, we lose. So that's affecting God's decision for us based on the stars. The Gemara say there was one rabbi, big tzaddik, Rabbi El Azar ben Pedat. That was his name. Very huge tzaddik and very, very poor. He doesn't have what to eat. Poor people of those generations, there were days, days they couldn't put a piece of bread in their mouth. Not like today. The poor people, they come to the restaurant by the end of the day. Hey, excuse me, sir, you know I have uh, such and such kids, we don't have food. Can you give me the leftover? Most likely they tell them, yes, here, take this, take this. They survive. They won't starve. We don't hear in America, in the history of the United States, that people die from starvation. Even in Israel. It's not such a rich country like America. People don't die, they, they get food. Somehow they get food. There's organizations, they, they left over here, left over there, they survive. In the old days, we see in the Gemara, people mamash didn't have what to eat. 
It's nothing to eat. Even the rich people sometimes there was problems in the world. It was hard to get food. So since he wasn't able to get any food, he only all he had is garlic. Imagine if you didn't eat for a day or two, now to eat raw garlic. So he thought, before I die, maybe the garlic will revive me. He ate garlic, and garlic on an empty stomach, he fainted. He felt very bad, he lost his conscience. Later, the people would smell him, would lose their conscience. But he, in the meantime, he lost his conscience. <laughs> so he lost his conscience. And now the Chachamim came and they saw him sleeping, smiling and crying at the same time. He smiled and he cries. When he woke up, oh, they saw also sparks of fire coming from his nose. Sparks. They told him, why are you, why are you were smiling and you were crying and then pieces, you know, fire came out of your nose. He said, Hashem came to me and said, I said to him, how long? How long I'm going to have to suffer with this poverty? And Hashem said to me, do you want me to reverse the whole world to the beginning point? Maybe you will be born in a better sign of the month. You know, there are 12 signs. Maybe you'll be born in a better sign. So he said to Hashem, what do you mean? You're going to reverse the whole world just for me and you still cannot guarantee me that I'll be born in the right time? So he asked Hashem, wait, I have a question to ask you. What is my question? My question is, did I live most of my life or not? Tell me if I, most of my suffering are behind me or there's still a lot to come. So Hashem told him, yes, you lived most of your life. He said, okay, so don't do it for me. I'll continue to suffer. Then they asked him, why did you smile? He said, because Hashem showed me my reward in the next world. He took me, showed me a place, 13 rivers of special oil. It's called a farsemon, farsemon's oil. We don't know what it is. It's not the farsemon's food that you buy today in the market, those sweet orange foods. It's something that we don't know what it is. It's something spiritual. All these stories, by the way, has a lot of secrets in them. The Maharal explained it. He has all the explanation about the secrets of the stories of the Gemara. So, I asked Hashem, that's all you're giving me? Only 13 rivers? Why not more? So Hashem told me, leave some for your friends. So I answered Hashem, if it, if it would be a, a human being that has to give me and he has to leave some for the other, then you're right. But Hashem, you have as much as you want. What's the problem? Give me a lot and give them a lot. So Hashem told me, if you're not going to be quiet, I'm going to shoot an arrow right in between your eyes. <laughs> so that's when the spark started to come out, and he woke up. That's the story. So what do we see from this story? One thing we learn, that the fortune of the person to be rich, healthy, uh, his marriage, all these things is also depend on what sign of the man he's born. But still Jews, with the power of prayer and power of tshuva can make things a lot better. Even though it affects everybody, we, with certain mitzvot we can overcome some of the decrees that we have based on the horoscope, on the signs. Okay, so Abraham Avinu sees in the stars that he will die without a boy. He's already very old. HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to him and said, Enough with this reading in the stars. In Egypt, they used to be experts. In the time of Moshe, when he came to Pharaoh, how did they tell Pharaoh, make sure every, first, every male born throw him to the Nile? Why? Because every day they went to check if the Savior of Israel is born or not. They see in the stars, if he's born and they throw him into the water, that's it. We don't have to kill them anymore. We need them. We need slaves. Every day they check. They threw babies to the Nile, they check. Did they kill, did they kill Moshe yet or no? Why? How do they know to throw Moshe to the Nile? Because they see in the stars that Moshe will have a tragedy in his life. What tragedy? With water. But they don't know exactly to tell. They know Moshe has a tragedy with water. What is the tragedy? When Hashem told Moshe, speak to the rock, and he hit the rock. Because of that, he didn't enter Eretz Israel. 
That's where the problem is. Hashem say, you embarrass me in front of everyone. That was one of the mistakes that Moshe made in his life. But they cannot tell. So they thought, Moshe is going to have problems with the water. Let's throw all the babies to the water until we see that he died. That's why Moshe's sister put Moshe where to hide? In a, in a, in a lake. Why you put a baby in a lake? Hide him in a basement somewhere. It's much safer. Put him in a lake. Who knows what's over there? People coming, taking showers. They'll find him there. So we see because it's all planned. Same thing with Osnat. Osnat is a daughter of, you know, we, we, are, we know the story that Esh, Yosef went to work for Potiphar. And Eshet Potiphar, she's trying to get Yosef to get involved with her. And Chazal says, if Chazal wouldn't tell us, who are we to know? That she meant well. She wanted to do a mitzvah. She's a married woman. How can she do a mitzvah trying to uh, invite a, a slave that came, Hebrew slave that came to work in her house? She changed her clothes and everything. She saw in the stars that she's going to have a baby with her, with him, with this tzaddik. So she said, if the star shows that I have to have a baby with him, I must do it. That's the plan of the creator of the world. Her mistake was that it wasn't her, it was her daughter. You understand? So you see that they read in the stars, but they don't know 100%. It's not a, a, a complete scientific science. So Hashem told Abraham, get out of it. I'm going to change your name, and I'm going to change your wife's name, and because of that, all the signs that apply to you right now, it's irrelevant anymore. And you're going to have a kid. And ben, you know, Avram is very old, Sarah is very old, she doesn't even have a wound. She's laughing. Avram is laughing. I can't believe. And then come Yitzchak. Then, then Hashem said that Avram fall asleep and he has a dream. Why? He asked Hashem, how do I know I will really inherit the land like you told me? Hashem just told him that he's going to give the land to his descendants. And Avram asked him, how do I know it will happen? So after that, Abraham has a dream. In the dream, Hashem tells him, your descendants will be slaves to another nation for 400 years. But the nation of Israel was in Egypt only 210 years. So Hashem told him 400 years. There are two explanations for that. One is that really 400 years is with X amount of hours a day. But if you take advantage on a slave and you choke him to work 16 hours a day, instead of 8 or 9 or 10, then Hashem makes it shorter because it's calculated to the last minute. How many minutes altogether they're going to be slaves? They try to push a lot every day, no problem. Instead of 400, it will be 210. Then there's another explanation because from the birth of Yitzchak, if you calculate, it's exactly 400 years until they came out of Egypt. Exactly 400 years. So this is it, for exactly 400 years, mamash, from Yitzchak until they came out of Egypt. You know, when Yaakov went to Egypt, Yitzchak was, six, Yitzchak was 60 years old. And Yaakov was 130 years in Egypt, 60 and 130, plus 210 years that they were there, exactly 400. You know, the Egyptians... In the time of Alexander Mokdon, Alexandrus, he occupied the whole world. He was the king of the world. The Egyptians came to him and said, you're the judge of the world. We, we sued the, the Hebrews, the Jews. We have a lawsuit against them. A real story, it happened. They came to the Supreme Court of Alexandros Mokdon. They said, what's the lawsuit? The Jews, when they left Egypt, they borrowed a lot of jewelry and all kinds of things, silver and gold. They came out of Egypt, they borrow it. They never return it. So we calculate 1,300 years, X amount of millions of Jews, they did a calculation. 15 donkeys full of wealth. With the interest, this is how much they have to pay us. The so Jews receive an invitation to come to court. So there was one rabbi, you know, he was short. He, he was a hunchback. He's crooked a little bit like this. He looks a little bit funny. So he came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, send me. I look like a fool, you know. I come like this. If I lose, you tell them, ah, this guy is not normal. <laughs> if I win, I win. So he came, he asked them, where is your evidence 
that the Jews took such and such jewelry from you and you calculated. They say, from your own Torah. We bring the proof from your own Torah. So, oh, very good. So it's legit, the Torah. Yes, they say. In the Torah, we work for you 210 years, multiplied by millions of Jews, X amount of hours a day. He did a calculation, say you owe us right away, in the middle of the trial, they ran away and they left all their fields. They left their fields. Because, you know, remember, now it's in their territory. Alexander Mokdon make a trial in their own territory. And the Jews came and took all their field. And Alexander said, you have it. You want the case. And it's interesting because it was Shnat Shvita. Shviit. There was nothing to eat. And their field was the Goim. They planted. It was full of all wealth. That's one time. Then, then it said that the Ishmaelim heard that you can sue the Jews in court. The Arabs, the Ishmaelim, they also came to Alexander. They said, we want to sue the Jews. He said, what do you want to sue them for? He said, we have a lawsuit against them. From where? From the Torah. From the Torah. What is the lawsuit? He said that HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised Abraham that he will give the land and everything to his children. And Ishmael was one of his children. Why the Jews took everything? Sounds familiar, no? So he asked them, where do you bring your proof? They said, from the Torah. He said, look what the Torah says. The Torah said that Abraham gave gifts to his children from Hagar and Keturah, and he sent them away in his lifetime. And all the rest, he, Yitzchak inherited, as Abraham ordered. So you got everything Abraham wanted to give you in his lifetime. And he sends you away in his lifetime. From the Torah. And they ran away. But today they came back. 2,000 years after Alexander, they came back. A hundred years ago, there was no nation called Palestinians. Check in their history. They don't have an anthem. They don't have a flag. They don't have a constitution from the past. It's all very modern. 60, 70, 80 years, that's all. Check. There was no nation like this. Do they ever have a flag? Did they ever had a government anywhere? Check in the history until Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres got Arafat from Tunisia to come to Israel. There were some Arabs lived in Israel. They never had a state. Before the Jews came to Israel, they never had a state. So if you claim that you, are, you were there, why? How come for 2,000 years there's no history that you had a government there? You didn't have anything. The Jews don't know how to come in the United Nations and show proofs based on the Torah, that the whole world recognizes the Torah. Why? Because those ambassadors that come to speak, they don't know two words from the Torah. That's the problem. Maybe they know law, they went to Harvard, they know history, they know whatever. But Torah? They never open in their life. One time I read an interview with Arafat, an Israeli newspaper reporter. The Israeli newspaper reporter speak to Arafat about Israel, and Arafat said, we can't. You don't know? We all came from Malki Tzedek Melek Shalem. And the Israeli asking Arafat, explain me. <laughs> explain me who was Malki Tzedek. You understand who they sent to interview this fox? <laughs> he doesn't know who's Malki Tzedek. That's what's going on here. Ay, 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 ay. The Khatan Sofer, Avraham Avinu, what was special about Avraham? You know, he was Isha Chesed, he brings guests, everything fine. What's great about Avraham, that he treated the low lives like the kings. The Arabs came to his home, he washed their legs. Here, he slaughtered three cows, he gave them the tongue. Who are they? Just people who came from the desert somewhere? You make such a party for them? Everyone who came to his home... Abraham opened the, the hotel for him free of charge, just make bracha. Abraham gave respect to everyone. Later on, it paid for him. Because of that, he became a legendary person for all religion. The Khatam Sofer, 250 years ago in Hungary, one of the greatest Ashkenazi rabbis in the last thousand years. Everywhere you go, you have the books of the Khatam Sofer, every yeshiva. On the Chumash, on Halacha, and Gemara. The Khatam Sofer, one Jew, secular Jew, came to him, not religious completely, to the biggest rabbi in Hungary. Rabbi, I want you to teach me Hebrew. 
He's a great guy. He comes to the biggest rabbi in the world. Rabbi, can I ask you a favor? Yes, teach me Hebrew. So the Khatan Sofer, in a nice way, was trying to send him to someone that will teach him Hebrew. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a very busy man. You know, I'm the, the chief rabbi of this whole country. I have a lot of important things. I cannot sit now and teach you every day an hour or two Hebrew. In a nice way. But that guy, Rabbi, I want to learn from the best. So the Khatam Sofer said, listen, if this guy, in a very strange way, insists that I will teach him Hebrew, something from Shamaim here cannot be. You know, no, no people are that fools to come and ask the chief rabbi. Imagine you go to Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, Rabbi, I came special to learn Hebrew with you. So Hazaku Baruch. Hashem will give you some wisdom. <laughs> but he started to teach him Hebrew. And he was teaching Hebrew for a while. And he was a clever person. He just grew up like a goy. So guess what was the end of the story? 20 years later, the Khatam Sofer was a judge in a Jewish court between two Jewish business people and about a lot of money. And he found that the first one is right. And he decided that the second person has to pay him X amount of money. The next person was so angry, he couldn't accept the, the verdict. He went to the king. And he told them, this rabbi, I have proofs that he rebelled against your kingdom. And he told his students to do against the law of this country. And he started to show him all kinds of things that the Jews do against the constitution. <coughs> they called up the Khatan Sofer and they told him, if we find you guilty, it's death penalty. That's how it was. No, what can you do? As he walked to the court, he sees somebody, a judge, call him, say, excuse me, come, come. Come to the room, come. He brings him in the room and he closes the door. He says, you remember me? He says, yeah, you're familiar. He says, you look familiar. He says, remember 20 years ago you taught me Hebrew? I went to law school, I became a lawyer, then I became a judge. I heard on the news that the government blaming you for rebelling against them, and I knew who you are, I learned with you every day. So I did everything I could to get the, the, the case to my hand. I'll be your judge, don't worry. Go home and sleep well. Whatever they say, I'll send you home. And that's how it was. Whatever the running, bringing, the, the, <laughs> the judge was twisting everything around, he sent him home. Because you know, they have a case. It's enough that the rabbi tell him something from the Torah, not always it's exactly what they demand. When you pay attention to the miserable people, you never know. One day it will pay off. In Israel, they have a yeshiva, and the rabbi likes to take his kids every Sunday to the field. There's a field somewhere, and he takes them, and they walk around, and they talk divrei Torah, and they breathe a little bit some air. And all of a sudden, a car stops by, fancy car, and one of the biggest criminals in Israel, famous one from the news, one of the gangsters, he comes out of the car, he calls the rabbi, 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 come. I want you to make bracha for my brother. What happened to your brother? Someone put a bomb under his car, explode, he's in critical condition. Here is his name. Here, he takes a bunch of money like this. Take it. All week, pray for him. <laughs> So the rabbi said, I'm sorry, I don't want the money, we'll do it for the mitzvah, no problem. No, no, take the money, don't insult me. No, no, I'm sorry, it's our mitzvah, it's a Jew suffering, we want to help. He was very impressed. Okay, no problem, thank you very much. He said, how did you know here? He said, I don't know, I passed by, I saw people religious, you know, and I, that was the first one I saw, I was looking for somebody religious. He said, yeah, we're coming here every Sunday, you know, we have a lunch break. The next Sunday, he shows up again. He stopped his car, he runs to the rabbi in front of all the Talmidim. He hugs him, kisses him. The rabbi says, what happened? He says, out of, against all odds, my brother had such a miracle, he's back to life. They didn't give him 2% chance. He's back to life. So I want, I see that the Torah has power. Can I come also learn with you in the yeshiva where you teach them? Slowly, slowly, he became friends with them, and he, one day on the news in Israel, they see, I don't want to say the name of this criminal, it's a, 
one day all of a sudden he has a yamaka. He started to make tshuva. You know what it is to save such a guy? Right the way you save the life of many Jews every month. Everyone who gives him a dirty look, two minutes later you heard about him that he needs Kaddish. <laughs> <laughs> they don't think twice, these people. One time, somebody told me I'm in a big problem. What? He said, I had a, I had a partner in business. He gave me an idea. And because of that idea, I opened a certain business. And I got him to work for me. I paid him a great salary. And I told him, tell me how much you want me to pay you for the idea. He said, no, no, it's good enough that I work for you. It's OK. That's no problem. You don't have to give me for the idea anything. So he worked for me for a year. Then he had to leave. He went to Israel. Six months later, he came back. And he said, I want X amount of money, a lot of money for the idea. Because he saw now the idea became a successful business. In the beginning, he didn't believe that something would come out of it. So he said, he didn't say, I want to argue with him about getting commission. But when he saw that he has already business that is bringing some income, now he wants a big amount of money. And the guy told him, come on. You left me in the middle. I had to find a manager. You didn't give me any, even a day notice. You left overnight. The business was struggling. It was life and death. You left me in a situation that I could have lost all my investment. Now you come and you want money? You don't, you're not giving me the money. I'm going to this person. As soon as you hear the name of this person, right away you take the money out. Why? Two, two days they give you. You don't bring the money, they kill you. They don't think twice. They first burn the store. You don't bring the money, forget it, what can happen? Mafia. So I'm going to go to them. Whatever they collect from you, I'll pay them a third. This guy got very nervous. He calls me up. Don't ask. I cannot sleep all night. He wants such an amount of money. First, I don't have it. Second, he doesn't deserve even a quarter from that. And what am I going to do? Because this mafia guy already called me that we have to meet. <laughs> I told him, don't worry, life and death is in the hand of Hashem. Tell me the name of the guy. Tell me the name of the guy. I never knew about him before. Right away, I started to make phone calls in the community. They told me, yes, this guy owned a lot of businesses. You know, nobody plays with him. He's a very dangerous person. He was in jail, in and out. Very dangerous. I said, okay. I found out where I can get him. But I found out that one of the people that is a partner with him in a business not that he wanted it, they don't have a choice. One day he come, he knock on your door, I like your business, I want to be your partner. <laughs> How much you going to pay? What pay? I'm doing you a favor, I will protect you from all problems. I want a third in a business. You say, yes, sir. <laughs> you don't have a choice. That's how they are, these dirty people. So, I found out that one of his partners is a guy that I made a lecture in his house. How everything works. I call up that guy, I say, can you make me an appointment with this guy? I say, you sure you want to get involved? I say, listen, this guy, I have to save him. He does a lot of mitzvot. Now it's time to pay back. He says, okay, I'll see what I can do. And it won't be easy, because he usually avoid things like this. I say, listen, do it. Then he calls me up the next day. He says, listen, it wasn't easy, but he's willing to meet with you. I met with him for a few minutes, so I told him, you know what, why, why are you going to start burning, killing, all these things? Forget it. Put me a judge between them. I hear both sides. You sit next to me, you see, I'll be fair. One interesting thing about it, these people can kill, they can burn your store, they can take your heart out with a knife, but they give respect to the rabbi. Unbelievable. People who are religious from, from birth sometimes don't give re respect to the rabbis like this guy. Unbelievable. He said, whatever you say. We went someplace, and I had to listen to the problem, you know, this guy, this guy. In the end, I decided that he has to pay him X amount of money. But it's very interesting how he said, okay, whatever he said, and the guys were screaming, no, it's not fair, it's not enough. We made peace between them in the end. But you see, sometimes I'm telling you, these guys, I was trying a little bit more to convince him to lose, to leave what he does. After two months, he calls me up. You have to help me. Pray for me. What happened? I have a big case in court. They want this. They want to do this for me. They want to do this for me. 
Already, already they connect to the Torah, they asking questions, do for me, pray for me, do this, do this, do that. You understand what's going on? Even the biggest criminal, if you speak to his heart, you can make him bad tshuva. Before we finish, because I know time is running out. Rav Chaim Kanievsky told his students, they asked him, Rabbi, this woman was buried yesterday. And everybody knows she was very wicked. She hated religion. She wasn't religious. But when she died, the police came and they wanted her body to take it to autopsy. To cut her body open and check the, the cause of the death. 2,000 religious people came and gathered the body ready for fight with the police. You're not going to touch the body. It's against the Torah to cut the body open after. A person is holy. Once he dies, there is a special respect that the body deserves. Kvod Amet. So a lot of questions in the Torah, Kvod Amet. For instance, they have a question in the Halakha, a Jew that a crocodile swallow him. He was swimming in Florida, let's say, a crocodile came, swallowed him, or chopped him to two halves, and he swallowed him. So most of his body is one piece. And it happens on Shabbat. So what's the question now? If he's going to stay in the stomach of the crocodile for more than 20 hours, there won't be any body left. Nothing. Even the bones. He smashed everything. If we kill the crocodile, we cut his stomach open, we take the body out. At least we bury him. There's a grave to come to. But we're not allowed to kill animals on Shabbat. So that's the question. For the respect of the body of the dead, are we allowed to do a violation to kill the crocodile? What do you think? Yes, of course. No. Don't be so sure. Shabbat is very, very strict laws. Only life risk prevents Shabbat for the time being until the life risk is over. If a person has a $15 million house and is going on fire, is he allowed to put the fire off? Even to call a goy and tell him, come, put my fire off, is not allowed. He can scream, if anybody wants to put the fire off, I promise he won't lose. That's the maximum we can do. If the goy is clever enough to know that this is a religious Jew, he's not allowed to give me orders on Shabbat, he comes, he puts the fire off, Saturday night he comes for his check. <laughs> the Mishnah brings it, the Masechet Shabbat. So the crocodile, for sure, by calling a goy to do it, it's... Permitted to call a goy to hunt the crocodile and open the body and take the Jew out, lo alenu, it's permitted. To tell Jews to do it, the, the answer to this question is unknown. The rabbi did not reach a verdict. Some say maybe, some say no, some say yes. The big question in the halacha. Why? Shabbat is not a joke. So the Jewish woman, she's anti religion. 2,000 religious Jews are protecting her body. The police gave up. The, the police saw it's going to be a clash there with the religious people. They gave up. And they bury her complete. So they asked Rav Chaim Kanievsky, what was the merit? No, actually he came to tell them. What was the merit of this woman that Hashem sent 2,000 people to watch her body? He says that he checked about her. When she was in the Holocaust, she used to go as a young woman, she's not religious, so all the Jews that are dead, she used to dig a grave and bury them. All the other people didn't care, they were in such horrible situation that nobody cared anymore, but she was one of the only ones who was volunteering to bury the bodies. So Rav Chaim Kanievsky says, everything a person does, he earns in the end, even if the biggest trasha. She was anti-religion, anti. But she did that mitzvah. Same thing with Izevel, the wife of Achav. She was a very wicked queen. And Achav was a wicked king. But when people had to be, have a wedding, Persian wedding, they clap a lot. So she used to go with the bride and clap. She likes to make the bride happy in a wedding. She's a very wicked person. When she died, the dog ate her body. Her legs and her hand, they didn't touch because she was busy with the mitzvah with this. It's the only mitzvah she was doing. The Gemara says, 
One of the butchers, he slaughters animals and he sells glad kosher meat. When he was cheating his customers, he's pushing some meat that is not kosher. One day he fell from the roof, and right away dogs from all over came and started to lick his blood and about to bite his body. So the Jews ran to try to scare the dog away. So the rabbi told them, leave them alone. They only came to take what they, what they deserve. So they told him, Rabbi, what do you mean? He said, the Torah say, when you slaughter an animal and it's not kosher, it's trefa, nevela, you throw it to the dogs. You have to throw it to the dogs. Have mercy on the dogs. You're not allowed to eat it. The Arabs will not eat nevela. The Arabs eat slaughtered animal. If it's not kosher, as long as it's slaughtered, they take it, halal meat. But nevela, like the Christians kill, shoot, and eat with all the liquid inside, they don't eat. So... You don't have what to do with that, throw it to the dogs. And this guy was, instead of throwing it to the dogs, he sold it to the Jews for Shabbat. Now the dogs came to take what he stole from them. The dogs came to claim what you owe us. Leave him alone. That's good for his soul. That's a part of his punishment. Why? Everything in the end, everybody pays for good or bad for what he does. Nobody can escape it. 100%. David Amelech started the Tehillim we'll finish with this I said it once in the lecture but we have to remember it because it's very important when a person writes a book he starts with the best thing he has to start with how Sefer Tehillim start Ashrei Adam Shelo Alach Be'atzat Reshaim Uvemoshav Letzim Lo Yashav how lucky is a person that didn't follow the advice of the wicked people, he didn't get involved with the wicked people, and didn't sit with all the people who all they care about is to laugh and to play cards and backgammon all day. He was busy with important things in his life. That's what David Amelech says. Then we have a question here. The Gemara brings us a story about Rabbi Yochanan Kohen Gadol. You know what to be a Kohen Gadol? That means you're the holiest person in the world. That you enter Kodesh HaKodeshim on Yom Kippur for a few minutes. That means you reach the highest level a person can reach. It's not a joke. From all the Kohanim, you are the Kohen Gadol. You cannot marry the divorced woman and cannot marry a widow. Almana also. Other Kohanim can marry widows, not divorced. Kohen Gadol is even holier. Even widow is not allowed. They prepare him the whole year for these five minutes prayers that he goes inside. Critical moments for the nation of Israel on Yom Kippur in Bet HaMikdash. So the Kohen Gadol, Rabbi Yochanan, after 80 years, became secular. He left the religion. After 80 years. The Gemara asks, how can it be? How can it be? The Torah said, if most of your life you are religious, you have insurance to protect you. Why? Chazaka, certainty that you will stay tzaddik. Then the Torah says, Kol amzaket arabim en chet v'al yado. Someone who tells the people to make mitzvot and teach them and commit them making mitzvot, automatically Hashem protects him that he won't be rasha. Why? That his students will not go to heaven and he's going to hell. And everybody will say, look, the rabbi went to hell and the student went to heaven. So to protect the honor of the Torah, Hashem helps the Rav not to make sins. That he won't have to go to hell. That's what the Gemara says. But here, Rabbi Yochanan, he left everything. What happened? He saw a person climbing on a ladder on a tree to get rid of the bird and take the eggs. It's mitzvah shiluah haken. The Torah said, thanks to that, you live long life. He fell from the ladder and died. Rabbi Yochanan said, how can it be? It's the opposite of what the Torah says. The Torah said, thanks to this, you live long life. The Chachamim told him, don't make mistake. Every time the Torah speaks about long life, is the life that it's really long, not 20 or 15 years. That's, that's a blink of the eye. Life of eternity. So, we see something very interesting. Chazal explained that you know what made him the way he is? Because he was involved every day. When he got to... 80, 90 years old, whatever he was, in that time when he became not religious, he was involved with the tzdukim. Tzdukim was people 
intellectual people that fight against religion non-stop. When you deal with this kind of people, no matter what you do, they affect you. They make you weak. Nobody is safe from this. You deal with them, you argue with them, they bring you down. It's very interesting. So they said, because in his generation there were so many tzdukim that started to speak against the Torah Shebaal Peh, against the oral laws, and making all kinds of questions, they made him weaker in his hate, in emunah, in his faith. And when he saw something like this happen, he left everything. David HaMelech starts Sefer Tehilim, be careful not to sit with the wrong people in the wrong place. Why? This is the most important advice to the life of a Jew. When you choose where to live, everything in your life will be affected by that choice. It's the most important choice of the life of a Jew. If a person is now getting married, 20 years old, 22, he met a religious girl, they both decided to get married. If they choose to live in Manhattan, or in Queens, or in Great Neck, or in Muncie, or in Jerusalem, that decision will determine their eternity and their children's eternity forever and ever. It's the most important choice. If they choose to live in a place that has plenty of not religious people, cars on Shabbat, police, hunking, you know, environment, people naked on the street, if they became righteous, they could have been ten times more righteous. Let, let them not be happy. Here, I live in this place with all these people on Shabbat, and I'm still keeping all the laws. Yes, if you live in Monsi or in other place in Lakewood, maybe you would be a hundred times better. But you don't know what you lose, because the, uh, the, uh, the atmosphere affects the soul of the person. There's no way to avoid it. Same thing, people that live in a good religious neighborhood, and they go a week away to places that they feel right away how their level of holiness goes down tremendously. No questions asked. As soon as I land in Las Vegas, I come out of the plane, two steps, you come out of the plane, you have already the casino over there. I feel like going back five years in religion, just coming out of the plane. Just breathe. In Hebrew, the word avir means air. The word atmosphere is also air. Avir, avira. Avir. What's avir? Air. To breathe. Atmosphere, avira. Why? The sins of the people contam contaminate the air, the avira. When you breathe it, you live in this place with these people, they affect you no matter what you do. Just by looking at them, you go down. Just by looking at them. The Gemara says, Even to look in their face, it's not recommended. Why? It brings you down in your level. Not to talk about if they're naked, if they care, if they listen to dirty music and they watch all day what they watch, to be with them together in the same place, that's what's going on. You understand? So that's why David HaMelech says, make sure where you choose to sit. Make sure where you want to live. Make, make sure where you want to send your kids. Later on, when you wake up, it may be too late. Bezrat Hashem, we'll do the right choices. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for Steve, of course, that you always organize, and to Michael Levy that put some efforts in this lecture. We'll see you on the next time. Good night. Thank you.